Hey Chemistry, Mrs. KJ here going over 5.02 Conservation of Heat. And we're going to do today's lesson a little bit differently. I have about a dozen slides here that I'd like you to take notes on and then we're going to look through some examples from the K-12 lesson. So make sure you write this down. Chemical bonds contain energy. This is potential energy because it is stored. So the energy is stuck. It's bonded between the atoms. And the fact that the energy is stored is why we call it potential. It has the potential, meaning it could do something. Just like you have the potential to clean your entire house from top to bottom. You could, you might not do it, but you could. <laughs> so that's a potential is. So when chemical bonds break, energy is released. And specifically, the types of energy that it can be released as are heat, light, or sound. So think of an explosion. You have heat. You have light. You have sound. All of that is energy being released because chemical bonds are breaking. Now, we're going to talk again about exothermic versus endothermic. So what do you remember? So I actually want you to hit the pause button, and while you write down exothermic and endothermic, think for 30 seconds, and think, what do I remember about all of those? All right, so hopefully you hit pause, and if not, do it now. So exo means out, endo means in, therm is talking about heat. So an endo exothermic reaction, exo exit, energy is released or given off in a chemical reaction. An example would be an explosion or a combustion. You can feel the heat being released. Endothermic reaction, energy is absorbed in a chemical reaction. A common way to measure the absorption of heat is as a decrease in the temperature of the surroundings. Because remember, we have a change. So a change would be the heat, and we're changing it so that it's getting colder. If you are touching the beaker with this reaction, so inside your beaker you have an endothermic reaction and you touch it, the chemicals will take the heat out of your hands and that will make it feel cold. So like if you ever have an ice pack, like maybe you keep one in your car in an emergency kit where when you pop the center and suddenly it gets cold, that's because there's an endothermic reaction and it's taking the heat out of your hand. Here are some other examples. So the following processes absorb heat. So this is endo. So separating ion pairs and changing state from solid, liquid to gas. These processes release energy or are exothermic, forming ionic salts, combustion, oxidation, mixing some salts with water, mixing water with concentrated acids, changes of state to gas to liquid to solid. On this slide, the only one that I expect you to know is the combustion and oxidation and the phase changes, which are for physical, but they still are endo or exothermic. So physical and chemical changes can give off or absorb heat. So again, let's look at why. Solid molecules are moving how? Slowly. They're vibrating, right? Barely moving, just vibrating. Whereas liquid molecules, oh, oh, let's move around, let's dance, we got more energy. Ooh, and that's the key. They can move faster because they have more energy. And where'd they get that energy from? They had to absorb it or take it in endothermic from their surroundings. So we're moving around, we're liquids, and then, wow, we're having a party. We are gas molecules. They're going crazy, right? Why? They have lots and lots of energy. Ooh, they have more energy than down here which means they had to absorb energy, endothermic. Whereas when the party's over, we cool off, our energy is less, we become liquid, and now the molecules are moving even slower. They lost even more energy, they're only vibrating, therefore going down is exothermic. So I think that that's the easiest way to remember your phase changes and whether they are exo or endothermic. Think about the speed of the molecules. So in this part, this should all be a review of what I just talked about. So make sure that you had your notes taken. In this part, you can just kind of sit back and listen. And if you have questions, let me know. Now, if you're thinking, oh, I can skip the rest of it, no, because there's going to be a quiz question based on this, so I know that you listened to it. So 
Just sit back and relax. Chemical reactions are driven by changes in energy. Physicists and chemists in the late 18th and early 19th centuries measured the energy changes, so remember, changes in energy, so in this case in the form of heat, that occurred during chemical reactions. They formulated an understanding of thermal energy, how it changes during reactions and phase changes, and how to predict which reactions will occur based on energy changes. Chemists thus learned a lot about chemical thermodynamics, or the dynamics, the changes of heat and your energy. In this unit, you will learn about the concepts of thermal energy and heat, which we did in the last lesson, enthalpy, specific heat, and the laws of thermodynamics. Chemical reactions involve mass, which is conserved. So that means the amount of mass you start with compared to the amount of mass you end with is what? Conserved means that you're keeping it the same. And that's one of the laws that we talked about when we balance chemical equations, that when you have a chemical reaction, the mass of the products equals the mass of the reactants. Chemical reactions involve energy. If that energy is released, it's exothermic. If that energy is absorbed, it's endothermic. Dynamite releases vast amounts of heat and light energy when it explodes. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite in 1866. The explosion of dynamite forcefully demonstrates the vast potential energy contained in chemical bonds of unexploded dynamite. Besides releasing energy, chemical reactions can also absorb energy to form chemical bonds. So instead of breaking the bonds and releasing energy, they can form bonds and absorb energy. The changes in energy during chemical reactions are an important part of chemical thermodynamics. Here you will learn about such changes in energy and how the total energy of chemical reactions is conserved. So again, the total energy overall is going to stay the same. Now, if you're saying, wait, I thought I was bringing energy in and out. Yes, but you have to not only think of the chemicals, but the environment around it that's either getting the heat or losing the heat to the chemicals. So we call the entire reaction and its surrounding the environment. Dynamite explosively demonstrates energy released during chemical reactions. In the early 19th century, chemists recognized that unstable nitroglycerin could be used as an explosive. Mixtures of gunpowder and nitroglycerin were used, but they were too dangerous to handle because nitroglycerin was so unstable. This hindered the use of this explosive both in mining and warfare. Um, a big thing with the mining that they used it for was when they made all the transcontinental railroads, so that was a huge use of dynamite. If you've ever seen Little House on the Prairie, um, in some of the episodes, they're like hauling dynamite. This hindered the use of the explosive both in mining and warfare. However, in 1866, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel found that if nitroglycerin was mixed with diatomaceous earth or sawdust, it could be handled and shaped safely. Nobel's invention of dynamite in 1867 immediately replaced gunpowder as the explosive of choice. Although Nobel became rich from an invention that is sometimes used in warfare, he was a very peaceful man. He was really upset that people used dynamite to hurt other people. He set aside his money in his will to establish the Nobel Prizes in science, peace, literature upon his death. So this is the guy that did the Nobel Prizes, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and one of them specifically is for peace. Where does the energy of dynamite come from? The chemical bonds between the atoms of nitroglycerin molecules are not still. They're constantly move. They bend, stretch, and rotate. These bonds have potential energy. Remember, potential means they can release energy. When nitroglycerin bonds break, the energy is released. Enormous amounts of energy in the form of heat and light in the following reaction. So our nitroglycerin turns into six atoms of dinitride, 12 molecules of carbon dioxide, sorry, that one's technically a molecule too, 10 molecules of water, and one molecule of oxygen gas. And it's all because these bonds are breaking. Exothermic reactions release energy, while endothermic reactions absorb energy. When a chemical reaction releases energy, the energy is usually in the form of heat. This type of reaction is called exothermic reaction. A common way to measure the release of heat is an increase in the temperature of the surroundings. So think of combustion or a campfire. 
you sit around the campfire, you can feel the heat spewing out of the fire. When, so it's going into the environment. So that's where it's showing it's going into the surroundings. When a chemical reaction absorbs energy, the energy is usually in the form of heat. This re type of reaction is called an endothermic reaction. A common way to measure the absorption of heat is as a decrease in the temperature of the surroundings. So heat will go into the reaction. All right, so we have a couple quick little videos. And our first one is exothermic reactions. And in our exothermic reaction, you can see that they are putting in a substance. And there we have some combustion. That one's a good exothermic. Also light and heat, sound, and sometimes even electricity is given off. So this is a voltmeter showing that electricity was given off. There's not always an obvious energy change. They put sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide together, and you can tell that there was different substances, but it's kind of like, yeah, whatever. But now they use a thermal imaging camera. So it's cold over here, it's warm over here because it's reddish, and this is so hot, it's turning white, white hot. So you can see that as it mixes, the entire beaker immediately gets super, super hot and heat energy is given off, which causes the temperature of the beaker and everything to rise. So the heat's been given off. And if you're like, well, how else can we show it? We can show it with a thermometer. In this case, they're using an electronic probe and it started off at 24.4 degrees Celsius. And you can tell, look at how fast this is going up, just instantly, as soon as they come together. So that temperature, is being the temperature is going up it's exothermic the heat is being given off not all reactions give out energy some of them obviously absorb ammonium thiosul ah, i can't say the word ammonium thiosulfate and barium <laughs> compound are being added now here's the thermal camera so you can see that their hand is a little bit warmer than the beaker and there's the surroundings and now they put the chemicals together and they're mixing it. And what do we notice? We notice that we're seeing blue because it's taking in energy. And even black, it's getting so cold. So energy is being taken from the beaker and the chemicals. The whole thing is cooling down. And again, we could show that by looking at the temperature probe. And you can see how it's going down. So again, combustion is a great example of endo or exothermic? Exo. And then we already talked about the phase changes and which ones are exo and endo. So if your molecules are moving faster, they had to take in heat, so they are endothermic. And have you ever gone hunting and used hand warmers? If so, that's another exothermic reaction. Some hand warmers consist of a cellulose bag, iron powder, water, and vermiculite to absorb the water. The water is contained in a thin inner bag surrounded by the vermiculite iron powder mixture. When you break the inner bag, the water and oxygen from the air react with the iron powder and begin to oxidize or rust the iron. Once begin, the reaction cannot be reversed and the hand warmer must be thrown away. Another type of hand warmer uses liquid sodium acetate encased in a plastic bag with a metal disc. When you press the metal disc, it creates a crystal of sodium acetate. As the liquid sodium acetate becomes solid, the temperature inside rises to the melting point of 54 degrees Celsius. The reaction is exothermic. So 54 degrees Celsius, your body is 37 degrees Celsius. So it's obviously warmer. So it feels nice and warm. The bag releases energy and warms your hand. This reaction can be reversed by boiling the bag. That's how you can reuse it. The sodium acetate will again return to a liquid state and the hand warmer can be reused. So I'm almost out of time, but I do want you to read this slide. So hit pause and just read it yourself. And this slide too, I'm gonna run out of time, but hit pause, read the whole thing. Main idea here, 
Heat energy does not appear out of the blue. You have the same amount of energy 